All right, well, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you that we have the joy and the honor and the mercy and the grace to be able to enter into the presence of the most holy God and go past the veil and be right there in the throne room in the place where only one man on earth could go um, and then only once a year and then only with the blood of bulls and goats but you allow us Heavenly Father to enter into the most holy place and we can do so every day and any day and any hour and any minute by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and it's an amazing and an awesome thought to us that you would open up this place that no one could enter under penalty of death except by that vicariously through that one man we can go in because of what Jesus has done and we can be there before your throne and it's a throne where the most holy God is seated and worthy of all blessing and honor and thanksgiving and praise and we could never say enough Father We could never lift our voice high enough and loudly enough and with enough passion because, Father, you're worthy of our worship with all of our heart and our mind and our soul and our strength. You're worthy of that kind of love. We come before you now. We don't know Barbara's brother's name, but we pray, Heavenly Father, for him during this surgery, which I think happens tomorrow morning. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will um, maybe put somebody in his path that would share the gospel if he doesn't know you. But maybe you can use Barbara with the gospel tract that she has to talk to him if he doesn't know you. But I pray, Father, this will be an opportunity for him to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We do pray for Joe and Madison, and we pray, Heavenly Father, for their walk with you, and we pray, beloved Father, that you will prepare them for the days ahead, for the years ahead, that makes me think of Patrick and Olivia. Amen. They, they'll be coming back this evening from their very short honeymoon. And uh, we want to pray for them. And we want to pray that you will ready them for the journey that you have already, they've already set out upon. And thank you, Father, for that. We want to pray, Heavenly Father, you'll bless us tonight as we share once again, very valuable, important lessons regarding the gospel. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, didn't mean to get carried away there, but... Uh, no, it's good. Best thing we can do. Quick review before we go into the last section that I have, or the last couple of things that I have for you. Uh, someone tell me what the gospel is. What is the gospel? That Jesus lived. That God so loved the world. He lived on this earth. He served in many capacities and about doing good. But then he was uh, crucified and buried and rose again and coming back to earth at another time. Great man. Why was he crucified? Because for God's love of the world. For our sins. For our sins. For our, sins. our sacrifice. Right. That's something that we couldn't do because he lived a perfect life. Right. 
everybody in this room, I don't think, I don't remember if Jennifer was in here or not, but everybody in this room did the three circles. So you remember those videos that we did, and they kept messing up on us and all that, and, and they would play fine on Jennifer's computer, right? I mean, we'd be downstairs, and they'd play fine, but we tried to play them in here, and it just wouldn't play. Anyway, um, um, Jimmy on there, um, his last name kind of jumped out of my head. It's Scoggins, I think. Okay. But anyway, um, he, he shared one time that he was preaching, and he thought he had done such a great job talking about the crucifixion, and, and uh, his pastor pointed out, you did, you did everything well, except you did not tell folks Jesus rose again. And uh, that's pretty important. And of course, David, David did. He just yes. did. That's I'm, that's what triggered this in my mind. And it's the whole gospel that matters. Yeah, if he didn't do that, he didn't defeat death. That's exactly right. If he didn't rise again, he didn't defeat death. And it reminds me of another story of a guy who heard a great illustration, a great illustration about the urgency of sharing the gospel, this preacher. And he was just so moved by this illustration of sharing the gospel, of how a man was driving by one day, and he looked and he saw early morning, and he saw a house on fire. And he ran to the house, and he burst through the door, and he ran upstairs and he grabbed the, the people in the house and he pulled them out to the road and dragged them into the yard. And he said, I'm going to use that. And so he got back to his church that Sunday and he says, I was driving by a house and, and all of a sudden I looked and I ran inside and I grabbed the people inside and dragged them to the into the yard over by the side of the road. And everybody just staring at him, shocked. And he got in the car and his wife said, well, honey, you forgot to tell him the house was on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and you see, sometimes we forget to tell people about the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Let me show you all a verse of Scripture. As we talk about this, look in Romans chapter 7. This morning I had Javier preach. He, he does more teaching than he does preaching here in, um, in Spanish worship. Mm -hmm. And I, I was real thrilled. We had four carry students today. Uh, but. Uh, he, uh, he said, well, what do, I, what do I teach? I said, let's talk about sin. I said, you talked about forgiveness the last time. And you kind of touched on sin. But let's talk about sin. And uh, I had him go through and I said, how do you have one of the things that we must impress upon people is the exceeding sinfulness of sin. He said, the what? I said, the exceeding sinfulness of sin. That sin is exceedingly sinful. So look at verse 13. Let's back up to verse 12. Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good, has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good. So that sin, through the commandment, might become what? Exceedingly sinful. And that's what mankind has forgotten or ignores 
is that their sin is not just some light thing in the eyes of God. Sin is exceedingly sinful. In light of the, perfect, the perfection of the Word of God, the perfect Word of God, in light of this, sin is exceedingly sinful. This is why Jesus was crucified. Because of the exceeding sinfulness of sin. This is why he died. And this is why we share the gospel. Now, what do you think, this is all review right now, but what do you think the greater hindrances are, because there's more than one of them, to sharing the gospel with others? What are they? The greater hindrances. Talking about sin. Talking about sin. Fear. Fear. Maybe almost embarrassment. Embarrassment can but, be. But you need to figure out what, what am I embarrassed about. Yes. What are one or two questions lack you of, would... Lack of knowledge. Lack, lack of lack knowledge. Of, is lack that, of your perceived knowledge, I think. Yeah. Might be another. I wouldn't know what to say. Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So what are one or two questions you would use to move the gospel, the conversation to a gospel conversation? We went over this last week. I gave mm -hmm. you... Do you ever think about spiritual things? Do you ever think about spiritual things? A way to introduce, it might be, do you have a church that you go to around here? That's a good one. And, and from that, then you could branch into spiritual things. Yeah. But you could even... You do. Then, have you ever thought about heaven and hell? Well, that. if they say, yeah, I go to a church, they, oh, good, you must think on spiritual things then. You could even turn it that way and make an affirmative <laughs> statement demanding an answer. If you died right now, you know for sure where you would go. Yeah. I asked a young couple that, they're, they're not a couple, they're a young, couple of young people, that this morning. We've got two who want to unite with our church. And um, they brought me those cards, just like we had the last time. One of them's going to have to be baptized, by the way, because he was sprinkled. Episcopalian. Presbyterian. A pres Presbyterian. Yeah. Korean Presbyterian. Which is going to be tough for him and his family, by the way. Y'all need to understand that. But anyway, um... These individuals, they came to me, I stopped them, and I said, I'm going to ask you, I ask this to everybody that unites with our church. I ask it to Debbie and Randy. Mm -hmm. But I said what you just said. Do you know for certain, beyond any doubt, that when you die, you'll spend eternity with God in heaven? I ask that. It's an important question. It's a good one to ask. And I use that a lot. If you come to a place where you know for certain that if you died right now, you'd spend eternity with God in heaven. We had a man who was a member of our church and he was a preacher. He was a preacher, a former pastor. And um, he was in his late 60s and he had to have a surgery. And I went to the hospital when he told me the day of the surgery, and I went in same-day surgery over there at Forest General. I went in same-day surgery, and his wife was standing there with him. And I looked at him, and I called him by name, and I said to him, ask him in this moment, do you know for certain, God forbid anything happened, but do you know for certain if anything happened that you'd spend eternity with God in heaven, 
he blew up. I can't believe you would even dare ask me such a question as that. And I said, brother, I ask it to everybody that's going into surgery. Everybody, without exception. Because if something happens to you, I have to preach your funeral. Yeah. His wife said, well, honey, just answer the question. That's exactly right. <laughs> I would think, this is a good chance for me to tell me, yes. But you know, if somebody blows up, you know, I'm wondering why. Yeah. Anyway. One of our deacons, one of our deacons, was having surgery. I asked him the same thing. And he went completely white. And he says, I, I don't know how to answer that question. Y'all, there are a lot of people, even sitting in our pews, that do not know for certain if they die, they're going to spend eternity with God in heaven. They don't know. And we need to, we need to be sharing the gospel. We do. Because too many, uh, and, and you, can't, you can't just call everybody out. You can't do that. But too many um, are uncertain that should be sure, that should be certain. And it has nothing to do with age. Has nothing to do with age. None whatsoever. None whatsoever. Isn't that a great guy for Satan to hide behind? It's to make somebody look like a Christian, but not, and to make convince them that they are, but not having really received Christ. Exactly what he does. In, in fact, that there may be people, when they open the Lamb's Book of Life, that say, wait, wait, wait Lord, uh, I ministered in your name. I went to the sick in your name. And he said, I will have to say, implying regrettably, I never knew you. I listened to a man the other day. I watched his video. Occasionally I have a few minutes I can watch somebody else's messages online and I watch this man preach. I've asked him to come here and do a revival meeting for us and thus far he has declined to even schedule it way out, <laughs> you know, to come here for whatever reason. But that's fine. The Lord knows who needs to come here and who shouldn't come here. But he said he never wants to see again what he had to see where he was in a hospital room with a man. And he and another man had to hold this man down to the ground, to the bed rather, because he was screaming in agony about burning in hell before he died. And um, he said, I never want to go through that again. Which is why I have for you, Brother Jim, you may do the honors if you don't mind. <coughs> A simple outline of the gospel. It's not a simple gospel. I said it wrong there. A simple gospel outline. It's a simple outline of the gospel. A very simple outline. It's not unlike the gospel tract that I gave to you. Not unlike it at all. But I have this for you. And I wanted to, I wanted to go through this with you. Before we put the other end piece on there, the other piece of bread, which would be how to draw the net. This is, this is repetitive for you. We've already covered this when we covered the use of the gospel track. But still, these are the verses I most often use when I'm sharing the gospel. I use more than this. I have committed to memory a number of verses that I will use to be able to share the gospel. But these are the elemental, the most fundamental verses that we can use as we're sharing the gospel. The first thing that I always begin with is the promise of God. 
Well, not always. I told you this morning about one instance where I didn't, where I jumped straight in and went to man's <laughs> problem, as a matter of fact. And that was that uh, group of young men who were, who were making mockery of, of life itself in and, and that one restaurant where I was. And, and um, I didn't even talk to them about God's promise of everlasting life to, until the end. I didn't do it. But that's where I began. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the gift of God, Romans 6.23b, the second part, the gift of God is everlasting life. This is God's promise. Now I'm not modeling how I share it, I'm just going through the outline right now. If you'd like me to model how I share it, one of you can be the lost person in a moment, and I'll model it for you. I'll be happy to. Uh, the Lord also says in John 10.10, 10, and I only quote the latter part of the verse. I sometimes quote the whole verse. But the latter part of the verse, Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, this is God's promise. He wants us to have life. It's everlasting life. And it's abundant life. But we have a problem. We have a serious problem. And the Bible says that all have sinned. There's none righteous. No, not one. Uh, the wages, rather the, the, the uh, scripture says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's no exception. It's true about me. It's true about this, if, if we're in where other people are, it's true about this person over here. It's true about you. It's true about everybody. We've all done that. And the bad news is, sin has separated us from God and from God's promise. And that promise is everlasting life. But sin has separated us. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And when you talk about death, that's speaking about a separation. God must punish sin. The wages of sin is death. I don't mind repeating that twice in that context. Now we try to cover and hide our sin, but it's impossible to hide our sin from God. We try all kinds of ways to hide our sin, to compensate for our sin, but you can't do it. We try to earn eternal life, but you cannot do enough to earn eternal life because the Bible says, that salvation is not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now let me stop right here. I use an illustration. It's personal to me. <clears throat> you can adapt it and use something similar for you. But this is personal for me. When I'm sharing the gospel, I use this all the time. And I say, I turn it around and say, Let's hypothetically suppose salvation were of works. It could be earned. Let's suppose that. But let's suppose, because heaven is only so large, let's suppose that there's only room enough for two more people. And you and I get up to the gates of heaven. And the Lord says, and it's not Peter who comes to the gate, it's the Lord the Lord says, i got room for two more. Which of you am I going to let in? And you start telling them what things you have done. And I listen to you tell them what you have done. And then I say, wait, wait, wait. Lord, I preached. Lord, I've been preaching this many years. I was a missionary. You know that I risked my life to share the gospel. You know that I fell ill to the point of death three different times, they said, 
to be able to share the gospel. You know all of these things about me. So, if there's only room for one, my works outweigh his works all the way around. And then I ask him, would that be true? Yeah, it'd be true, they usually say. And I said, now, somebody else walks up, and they've lived in China, and they died for the sake of the gospel. And they say, no, Lord, this is what happened with me. I said, which one of us is going to make it in? It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. And then somebody walks up and says, Lord, I'm one of your children. Yeah. And I point out, our problem is, we can't be strong enough to save ourselves. Romans 5, 6 tells us, when we were yet without strength, Christ died for us. We were weak mm -hmm. and not able to save ourselves. So God has a way He provides for us. We can't do it. We can't save ourselves. But God provided the solution. In Romans 5.8, the Bible says, God commends His love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I go back to John 3.16 here as well. Like we already said, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that, who, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent Jesus to be the prize for our sin. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross to pay for our sins. He was buried and God raised him from the dead three days later. Now what does that have to do with us? What do we do? The Bible says we must repent. Acts 3.19 says, Repent and be converted so that your sins may be blotted out. The Bible says we must believe. For by grace are you saved through faith. The word faith means by believing. Not of works, it is the gift of God. Not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. We must believe. That's what the word of God says. Now, we have to receive the Lord. We have to receive Him. So we repent and we believe. But that's not the end of it. We have to receive Him. I often use an illustration at this point, and I find some way to do it. And um, sometimes I'll use just a simple card, like my business card here. I'll use a simple card, and if I have something I can stick it in, I have this sermon outline here that would work just as well. Um, I'll put it in and say, now let's suppose this represents eternal life right here. And the Bible says the gift of God is eternal life through or in Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to take this. Let's imagine it's a check for you, $10,000, Jim. Wouldn't you love $10,000? Think of the things you could do with it. Well, I'm going to put it right here. In order for you to receive the check, you also have to receive the Bible. Or whatever I have in my hand. The gift of God is eternal life, but it's in Jesus Christ, it's through Him. And in order to receive eternal life, you must receive Jesus. What does that mean to receive Jesus? The Bible says in John 1.12, as many as received him, even to those who believe on his name, he gave the power or the right to become sons of God, daughters of God. If I'm speaking to a woman, I will emphasize it, daughters of God. You can be a child of God, a daughter. And I will do that at that point. I'll still have this in my hand, by the way. 
And I'll say, all right, I've told you I'm going to give you this gift. Is it yours? Not till I take it. it. Exactly right. You'd be surprised how many of them don't understand that until you point it out. They never sold real estate. Mm -hmm. You don't have a sale until you have the check in your hand. Yeah. You're the agent. <laughs> That's right. Not until I take it. There's another illustration we use that I, that I very often use, and it's related to traveling. And it's related to flying. Well, it's, it's, it's a cultural thing, so it depends on where I am. Most of the time it's flying these days, but in Peru I had to use it with taking a bus. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, because a lot of people never flown. But they had ridden buses. Sure. And this is what it is. You get a boarding pass. You go to the airport. You present your ticket. They give you a boarding pass. You go through all the hassle you have to go through to get to the gate. You get to the gate, and you're waiting there at the gate, and the plane comes up, and people deplane, and then they call you to catch your flight. You can look at your ticket all day long and say, I have a ticket. I have a boarding pass. But until you, what do you have to do in order to take your trip? Uh, get on the plane. Got to get on the plane, got to get on the bus. Exactly right. And so you must, you must receive the Lord. You must come to that place where you get on the bus, get on the plane. We must repent, we must believe, we must receive the Lord, we must confess the Lord. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes under righteousness. What does he believe? That God raised Jesus from the dead. But with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Then I bring them in, and I transition with Revelation 3.20. I need to show you one more verse. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him. I shared this with you as we were talking about the trap and the importance of that. But this is the point where I'm going to draw the net. This is where I'm closing the, the, the moment and pressing them for a decision. Because the gospel conversation is not complete unless we press them for a decision. You have been informational up to this point. Now is the point to ask them if they want this as a part of their life. And so I use this, and I say it to them as I've got it written here in the small paragraph. Now this is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking right now. He's the one standing at the door. He's the one who knocks. If your best friend, who's your best friend, Sean? What's his name? Ben. ben. If Ben showed up at your house, hello Ben, if you're watching, do not tell Ben he's got to watch. I'll, I was just texting with him, I'll tell him. If Ben showed up at your house, and Ben stood at the door, and he knocked, and he said, Sean, it's me. What would you say to him? Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. Well, he would give me a goofy face and then I'll say, come on in. Yeah. 
Now comes the questions. Is there any reason you couldn't ask the Lord to come into your life now? To be your Lord and Savior? Any reason at all? Is what I'm, does this make sense or did I muddle it? Did I completely mess it up? Don't ask the question, do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Don't ask that question. Turn it around. Does this make sense? Am I, am I just, am I muddling this for you or, or have I made sense? Because that's where you want to see where they are. Is it something you believe is what is true and what you need right now? You can tell the Lord right now that you want them into your life. You want to do that? You can do it right now. When they ask me, when they say that to me, and they say, yeah, this is something I want to do. I say, okay. This is good. Depending on their age, depending on their Bible knowledge, I may review what we've talked about very quickly. Just like David just shared the gospel in a capsule form. I may do that very quickly. But I will do this. I'll stop and say, let me, let me pray. Let me pray right now before you say anything else. And I'll pray the Holy Spirit illuminate their heart and give them the ability to, to comprehend the importance of the decision they're about to make. And then I'll say, because I've led in prayer, I've begun the prayer time, our heads are bowed, our eyes may or may not be closed depending on the location we are, I'll turn to them, and I'm not praying loudly because we're close together. I'll turn to him and I'll say, now, if you truly want the Lord in your life, I want you to tell him out loud right now. I don't know how to do that. Well, it's a conversation. Tell him, and I'll, you've heard me do it from the pulpit up there, what, what a person should pray. Um, if they're still reluctant, I'll ask them. I, I don't like to do this, but I will ask them. Could I lead you in a prayer? I'm real reticent to do that. But sometimes I do. And then I'll pray and have them repeat it out loud. A lot of times, when, once I get the motor running a little bit, it's kind of like pushing the car, jumps, you know, you got to push off those old standard cars. Once you get it in first gear, they just take off with it themselves and they keep going and you just, and you know then, yeah, they've connected. They've connected. And that's where I bring them in. I bring them back to Romans 10 again. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And Jim, if that were you, I'd say, look at you, and I'd say, who's your Lord? And my answer should be Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. I don't ask them how they feel. I don't remember in here him saying you will feel a certain way. Exactly right. Exactly right. I thought Ben may have been watching and <laughs> sent me a message. I do not ask them how they'll feel. But I had so many say to me, Michael, when I led him to the Lord, Michael said, oh, 
I feel so good. And there was a complete difference for him on that day. That's good, but feelings come and go. Feelings do come and go. They absolutely do. Our confessions, once we made it, once we try to follow, that's that's not going to change. And as, as somebody that accuses me of doing wrong things, as he accuses, I can say, yeah, I understand what you're saying, Satan, but on this day, I gave my life to Jesus. Uh huh. Sorry. You notice that gospel track I gave you guys had a place in the back where you could sign it? Yeah. And right there in the very back of it, you can sign that, and you can, you can say, on this day, I receive the Lord, and you sign your name to it. On this day, I pray to receive Christ. I trust the Lord. I have people do that. Sometimes, sometimes, um, there have been instances in which I have actually uh, given somebody a Bible here and there, both places, and I have written in the front of it a full statement of their decision for Christ and had them sign it and date it at that point. Um, and tell them the time is coming when this is going to be an issue. But I will tell them this in a, by way of immediate follow-up. I often tell them this. Now, what you, just, what you just signed right here in the front of your Bible, what you just signed right there, I want you to look at that every day, and I want you to pray this. Lord, on in Michael's case, January the 6th of the year 2021, I invited you into my life and I asked you to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. And you pray that every day for the next 30 days. Because you get them to pray for 30 days, you're going to pray for more than 30 days, aren't they? And it also helps with that attack that's going to come their way uh, at a later point. It always helps with that. Any questions? I didn't model it, um, so to speak. I could model it. I haven't talked to you about sharing your testimony. I have done that in the past. You need to be able to share your testimony inside of two minutes. Three tops. You need to be able to do that. And where would you place your testimony? In the midst of those exploratory questions. In the midst of those opening questions. Let me tell you what abundant life means for me. Let me tell you where I was. When I taught CWT, continue, continuing witness training, I would share my testimony one of the first classes, share my testimony. And y'all, every class, every single class, for 16 weeks, every week I took them out somewhere. Every time. I took a group with me, and I said, okay, I never taught more than just a, a handful, you know, five or six. And they would come with me. I'd say, all right, we're going to load up, we're going to such and such place. We're going to talk to so-and-so today. And I'd get up in there and I'd share the gospel. And I'd, I'd always begin, as I'm telling you now, and we'd get to, the te to my testimony. After about three weeks of hearing me share my testimony, I would, I would tell one of them, we're going back up there, I'm going to share the gospel. Um, Sean's going to share his testimony today. First time I did that, guy named John Baptist. I'm not kidding. Juan Bautista. John Baptist. 
I said, I want John to share his testimony. Juan's going to share his testimony. And we get up there, and I'm watching them. You know, when I get to this point, and I'm sharing, I said, as a matter of fact, John, won't you tell them what happened to you? And I'm watching the bullets popping off of him. He's sweating bullets, and he's just, he's about to die over there trying to share his testimony because he's never shared the gospel before. And then I'll take them through and I'll let them share the first part, God's promise, and I'll pick it up from there. And then we'll move to two parts and so on and so forth until they can fully share the gospel. I haven't done that to y'all. Don't you love me even more right now? I haven't done that. I should. I should take you over to the mall and let's get kicked out of there for sharing the gospel. You know, because they call that soliciting. I don't know why. We're not off. We're not trying to sell them anything. But these are, these are elementary and elemental, the most indispensable truths that I can give you about the gospel. The most indispensable. If we don't have any questions, we'll have a time of prayer. And we will be dismissed. Carolyn, would you lead us in prayer? Father, thank you so much that um, we could come here these last few Sundays and talk about sharing the gospel. And I pray that you help each one of us to be able to do that without fear and with confidence. And I thank you for Brother Kevin sharing with us. And I pray again that you'll be with Barbara Norris's brother as he has surgery. I pray that, his, that he's given his heart to you and that everything will be okay with him. I thank you for all of our, our church members and thank you for the wonderful sermon that we had today. We thank you for the fellowship that we have here. I pray in your name. Amen. Amen. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, guys. Next week, we're going to start.